and turn it over to our moderator for today, Caitlin Kenny, and our panelists for introductions. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we are going to start with introductions so that you can get to know each one of our panelists and the uh, what they're working at, their organizations, and their expertise. And we'll start with Heidi Jimmer, my colleague. Thanks, Caitlin. Hi, everyone, and glad you could be here. My name is Heidi Seamer. I am the Outreach and Digital Equity Coordinator here at the Western New York Library Resources Council, and I have been involved in doing uh, state-level uh, advocacy since I started my position as Regional Archivist for the Documentary Heritage Program back in 1990. Um, and, but I've been doing it more specifically for Winnie Lurk in the library community um, since about 20, 2014. So glad to be here. Thank you. Max Shenick. Hi, my name is Max Prime. I'm the Director of Government Relations and Advocacy for the New York Library Association. I came on board back at the end of January of 2023 and have been around for a couple of sessions now. Um, Happy to be here in the library community. Before this, I uh, worked in a number of congressional offices on the district side, connecting constituents and uh, groups in district to the legislators themselves on important issues. Um, and prior to that, I got a master's in teaching and taught for a little bit. So um, happy to be here today and uh, to join all of you. Thank you so much, Lucy. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Lucy Waite. I am the Director of Library Services and Instructional Resources at Villa Maria College. I am also a member of the LEAP Committee, um, Library Education Advancement and Partnership, or Advocacy and Partnerships. Um, so I've participated in a number of these events, and I'm kind of offering a little bit more of a um, personal user perspective um, on, on what you can do to advocate for your library. Thank you. We're going to go alphabetically here. Brian Holt. Hi, good morning, everybody. I'm Brian Holt. I'm director of the Hamburg Public Library. I've been director here for seven years. Um, before that, I oversaw the library's bookmobile. And before that, I was branch manager uh, several Buffalo branches. So I do have some advocacy experience, uh, specifically or, or especially at the Hamburg Public Library. I'm happy to be here today. Thank you. And bye, and Mayor. Hi, everybody. I am Brian Mayer. I'm the head of the school library system um, at Erie to BOCES down in Fredonia. Um, I'm also on the LEAP committee at the Western New York Library Resources Council with Lucy and a number of other fantastic people. Um, I'm also the VP of Advocacy for the School Library Systems Association. Um, and in that regard, also serve on a, a handful of sort of advocacy and legislative communities, um, working alongside Nyla, Max, and others on their team as well, too. Fantastic. Thank you. So we're going to lay some groundwork today by diving in with discussing NYLA, what NYLA does, and their work with advocacy uh, at the state level. And we're going to start with Max. Max, I have a question for you to start things off. How do library staff locate NYLA's preferred messaging for the year? Great. Yeah, so the best way you can uh, locate NYLA's messaging and our uh... 2025 priorities uh, would be just on Nyla's uh, website. We have an advocacy center there and I can show you by sharing my screen just how you get there. So about this here, share, let's see. So essentially all you have to do is go to www.nyla.org. We'll bring you to the home screen here. If you go up to the top menu, scroll over to advocacy, there's a drop down menu of a, a few different things you can look at. If you're wanting to find what our, um, you know, our, our current priorities are, what our current messaging is, you just go to 2025 legislative initiatives. And here you will find just a, a little overview of where we are and how we came to be where we are our policy initiatives. So the policy initiatives are the things that we're looking at specifically. Um, 
kind of on the, the legislative side, not focused on funding or budget, but specific policy changes we'd like to see. So we have the Freedom to Read and our two big acts that we have been supporting, the uh, School Side Freedom to Read Act and the Protection of Public Libraries uh, Freedom to Read Act, ebook licensing reform, and media literacy in New York State. And similarly, we have our state budget asks on the uh, furthest right side. So you'll see New York State operating aid, we're advocating at $176.8 million. Uh, oh, looks like the M got dropped off of there. I will fix that right after this. Uh, for the New York State Library Construction Aid, we're looking at $175 million. For library materials aid, $11.33 per pupil. And for Novel New York, we're looking at $3.1 million. And this is what we're advocating for across the board. Um, and for each of those, uh, there's a little write-up about why we are asking that amount of money and, and how we got to that decision. Uh, and in the coming week or so, there will be uh, additional resources that will populate for each of these. Uh, as you see here, we have um, on the policy side, our memos of support and links to the bill text themselves. Uh, and then on the... Um, uh, budget side of things. Uh, we have some uh, resources that will be updated, but are kind of evergreen, like our history of library aid chart and a chart about the impact of underfunding. Uh, similarly, we have a history of construction aid charts, uh, testimony that Nyla gave last year. And uh, every year we add new one pagers to these uh, things that you can hand out to your legislators uh, that you can just click and download uh, that gives a, a nice overview and a handout that you can bring to your uh, uh, your meetings with legislators to make sure they know. So those are all being updated this week uh, and they should be all added here uh, in time for, for next week. Um, Similarly, uh, or kind of if you want to go beyond this, we have our legislative priority archives where you can take a look at everything we've done in past years. Those have some examples of some of those one pages I was talking about. Uh, you can click to become an advocate, which will give a nice sign up. And if you go here, uh, it will uh, and enter your information and in. you'll get an opportunity to receive all uh, alerts that we have about things like take action campaigns or other advocacy updates that we want to send you uh, that um, gets fed into us and we can take a look at that. Uh, we also have a contact elected officials button where if you click that, it'll bring you to uh, our current take action campaign that we're running. Uh, we'll have a new one about banned books coming up soon or you know, not banning books. Uh, then we have pages for Advocacy Day and Spring on the Hill, which uh, are two events that we run uh, uh, later in the year. Uh, Advocacy Day, where everybody comes together and goes to the Capitol to advocate for our priorities and Spring on the Hill, which is a uh, event a little bit later in the spring for more seasoned advocates who want to deepen their uh, advocacy chops. And I'm happy to uh, um, highlight anything if I missed anything anybody would like to see. Wonderful, thank you. Um, in the chat, you can find a link to the page that Max was on with the legislative initiative for 2025. So I encourage everyone to click on that and explore it while I move on to the next question, which Max, can you please explain how Nyla determines this messaging and the key points for the current year? How do you come up with these numbers? Yeah, so, um, you know, it. It, we have the same kind of general process every year where Nyla has the, the legislative committee that is built uh, around representatives from all corners of the, the library field in New York, uh, so that we have representation from all different perspectives uh, within the profession there, uh, because as we all know, we are all stronger when everybody comes together and advocates for each other. We leverage our numbers. Um, so we like to have that group uh, work on developing what our priorities are going to be, what our focus is for the next year. And, and that changes from year to year what our focus is, though every year we do have strong focus on our funding initiatives, which are our core components of this every year. So uh, this year we increased our asks uh, for, um, you know, across the board. Um, we did that because our previous asks, while they were, you know, higher than uh, where what we've been getting significantly, and, you know, they're not likely to just kind of give us everything that we want, <laughs> Will be great, but uh, you know we we go with negotiating numbers. Um, this year, we all decided in the legislative committee to go a little bit higher to be uh, more directly reflective of what actual need is in the library community, and to simplify how we got to these numbers and the justification for them. So, advocates, when you go out into the field, it's easier to explain to your legislators how we got here. So, for the uh, one hundred and seventy-six point eight million dollars that we're asking for for operating aid. 
We got to that number by taking what the original statutory level of aid that we were supposed to get way back in 91, 92 fiscal year, uh, and just adjusted it based on inflation out to today. So, hey, this is what you said we deserved back then. This is what that would be in today's dollars. And that doesn't even account for all of the different ways that costs have expanded for libraries over the years. So it's just very simple. This is the original amount adjusted for inflation. You can see we're nowhere near that. You got to increase us to be at least close to that. Second, for the construction aid, we took a look at the uh, five-year estimate for uh, the current five-year estimate for uh, statewide construction needs from uh, the Division of Library Development. We said, okay, that's over five years. What's one year of that? And, you know, take a look at what's one year of that. That's $350 million. What's roughly the library share of that? 50% roughly. We're, you know, it's still a lot higher than what we're getting. So we just said, this is what for one year of the current statewide need as assessed by Division of Library Development, this is what we need as a library community to get that done. So just, again, being very pragmatic about this is what we need, this is what we are asking from you, and having very direct ways to get to that. Um, for the library materials aid, it's been a little bit different. That's roughly around you know half or so the amount that is needed for one book per pupil. But that's been a, a very, very, very long fight that we have had to try to get that uh, increased. Way back to 2007, that hasn't been increased. But this year, when the uh, committee looked at that, we saw that um, we had actual traction in the legislature last year around the $11 number and that we had been advocating for. And around... Uh, adding to that each year according to the consumer price index adjustments. So this year, the number we went with was that $11 number that we had had traction on and adjusted it roughly three, you know, 2.93% for what that would have uh, increased to for the year. So again, staying the course on that, building on the momentum in that case that we've had and trying to get that across the finish line this year. And likewise for Novel New York, last year we asked for that $3 million. This year we're asking for 3.1 so that we can try to adjust for any cost increases that we would have over the past year and keep the same, uh, at least the same amount of materials that we have this past year. But again, every year the uh, legislative committee comes together to, to set those numbers and to decide kind of what we want to be focusing on for the policy side this year. Uh, we have a long list of priorities we've been working on as a community. We tried to, this year, narrow things a little bit in our specific focus, what we're really dialing in on. Uh, that doesn't mean all the other uh, you know, wonderful priorities that we've had in the past are going to completely go away, but we do have a kind of core focus in our messaging we're trying to nail in on because it can be hard to send everybody out into all of the different uh, uh, legislators' offices and to speak with the, the folks that are in their areas. Um, and have this massive sprawling list of, uh, of priorities that we you know, make a little bit of ground on, but don't have that kind of focused, coordinated effort to, to try to push through. And that, that focused, coordinated effort, boosting numbers like that and having consistent narratives and messaging is really one of the big ways that we can uh, affect change on this. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to move on to some of our other panelists to uh, ask them to share how they incorporate Nyla's messaging into their advocacy efforts, how you spread that out into the community, and why you feel it's beneficial to have this unified message and to take Nyla's initiative. And Heidi, I would like to start with you. Okay, so I think one of the things as I was listening <clears throat> to Max, um, it was reminding me of a lot of circumstances in our past advocacy efforts uh, when we've been to visit our local state legislators. Um, just depending on their position, their political position, if they're in the majority or minority, um, the minority people tend to be a little more strident about um, certain topics uh, because they're in the minority. Um, but I think one of the things that we try to play on is that library funding is kind of a bipartisan issue um, and that, you know, whether you're a Democrat or Republican or anybody else in between or at the other opposite ends, um, funding for libraries satisfies almost every pretty much every demographic within New York State. Um, it will meet a need no matter what. So we try to focus on the idea of a bipartisan message. Um, I think the other thing too is that 
uh, we talk about this need in broad strokes with the you know statewide dollars 176.8 and 175 million um, and what the legislator is thinking is what does that do in my district and so we have to visualize for them how some of that money gets to their district and benefits their voters or their constituents. And so um, construction aid is a really good example. Uh, you don't want to take them to all the bad space library spaces in their district and say, look, they need help. But you want to also make sure that they see the really good spaces and they see what potentially could happen throughout their district if this uh, construction aid was available to all of their um, all the libraries, public libraries in their district. So I think a lot of it is, you know, taking those broader messages and using your local reality as the visualization um, to help them understand this message. Wonderful, thank you. And by Mayor, I would like to hear from you, um, your perspective, doing this at a system level for the school library system. Uh, absolutely, thank you. Um, I, I first just want to say, you know, the work that Nyla does um, is, is is phenomenal, right? Like, and that messaging that they build really does come from the input of multiple voices. Um, and they pull that together to try and build a unifying message that everybody can sort of take and move forward with. So at the system level, uh, we, uh, at the school system level, and then this would be indicative probably of other systems as well, too, we take that messaging and then we apply sort of the, our lens, we incorporate that messaging, we are in a uh, sort of a place where we're able to share that out uh, with stakeholders and, and people of interest to help raise awareness about the issues and why they're important. Um, so at like the school systems level, we'll reach out and help raise awareness of, of our school librarians. So they're informed and up to date in regards to um, the initiatives, the efforts um, and things that have momentum at the state level, things that are uh, starting conversations as well too. We're able to reach out to school district administrators, teachers, other stakeholders, um, local um, uh, legislators as well too in regards to meeting meetings and uh, a lot of times we'll do work where we'll we'll take that messaging and we'll uh, put together one sheets flyers sort of marketing awareness pieces that reflect um, our lens as well too so that we're caring for that language and much to what um, Heidi said you know you're able to incorporate uh, sort of real world boots on the ground examples of why those pieces are important. Uh, we're in a position where we can sort of pull from the groups that we work with um, examples of, of that work and then be able to share those pieces out. And can I just add something to what Brian just, the word Brian used is really important, education. Um, to me, advocacy, a lot of advocacy is really education. I know some people are uncomfortable with the idea of advocacy, thinking it's too political for them, that they really shouldn't be doing it. But in reality, um, I feel like it's a fine line between whatever political advocacy is and educating. Um, and Novel New York is a perfect example. I think that Brian would agree when we went in to speak with uh, legislators last year, a lot of them didn't even know about Novel New York. It was an unknown to them. And so we had to explain to them that this is a free resource to every person in New York State. Um, and that, that you know, it, for the amount of money that they're spending, the, the return on investment is incredible for all of New Yorkers. Um, and so once they knew about it, they were on board because they they saw the logic, the practicality of it. So I think education is is a huge part of what we do. Thank you for mentioning that, Heidi. It's very true, and they really do like learning about the resources that libraries have to offer. So it's very important to share this information with them because many of them, as Heidi said, don't know about some of these resources. 
As I find mentioned that Max unfortunately had to step away and will be available for the rest of the webinar, so I'm glad we were able to talk to him first. We will be sharing his contact information at the end so that if you do have follow-up questions relating to Nyla's messaging or any other advocacy efforts that Nyla is involved with, you are able to email Max, so we will share that later. We do have time for a quick poll before we move on to the next session. Um, I would like to know if you know your library's representatives in the state senate and the state assembly. This is just a yes or no question. And if you know how to access that information, uh, we will share those links. Uh, it's super easy, fortunately. Looks like we have a few people that said no, a few people that said yes. Okay. Great. And if you are curious and don't know how to find that information, we do have some links for you. Uh, this is for assembly. You just type in the address of your library. And it will pop up with your assembly member. And then for your state senator, it's the same thing. And what's really great about this tool too is when it pops up with your representative, it will take you to a profile of them so you can see all the communities that they're on, which is very important to learn about. Uh, any news that they might have, legislation that they worked on. So it is good to know this information before you meet with them, just to have an idea of what their values are and what they're all about. I am going to tap in Heidi again to talk about what are some best practices for scheduling appointments with your representative, both in Albany and locally, uh, how you schedule meetings with them, and what kind of steps do you take when you're reaching out to the legislator's office? Okay. Well, um, <laughs> it's a lot of practice. It's a lot of patience. Um, there's a lot of them. We have, we have, uh, well, we should have 18, I believe, or 17 uh, Senate and Assembly members in the Western New York region that we try to meet with every year. Um, and trying to schedule with them is incredibly tricky uh, because they have very full meeting schedules. And so you have to plan on being very flexible and very adaptable um, when you set these meetings up because you will get a call inevitably, after you set a date and time to change the date and time at least once. Um, so so being flexible is uh, and being adaptable is really one thing and being accessible that they can get a hold of you right away um, to make any changes in the schedule. Generally, every office has a scheduler, a person who does the actual calendar scheduling. So even if you have a connection with a chief of staff or a legislative aide, you still probably need to email because they, I, I think for their own record keeping, they prefer that you start with an email request to schedule with the scheduler. Um, and you can, you know, CC the, the contact that you have in the office. Um, but generally you want to reach out to their scheduler to see what availability is. And then, um, when they're in session, which generally starts after the first of the year, um, the legislators will be in Albany, generally speaking, Monday through Wednesday. So your appointments are mostly going to fall on a Thursday, Friday um, when they're in session. When they're not in session, you have more flexibility when they're home. But um, it's usually a Thursday, Friday. Um, and again, it just depends on their other meetings. Um, then I would say that, you know, the location and the size of the visit, they may, they may tell you what their preference is. Um, we started off meeting in their offices because it was easier for them. Um, but then we started asking them to meet us in the libraries and through the years we've tried to rotate. Uh, we look at where we've met in the past years with each one of them and we say, oh, okay, we met in a public and we met in a school. So let's try to get to a hospital or an academic this year or special. So we try to um, we try to rotate with them the kind of library they'll be visiting just again for that visualization of the discussion we have about 
different types of libraries and different work they do. Um, and so that's partly how we determine the, the location. And again, size depends. Um, I say the more the merrier generally. Uh, you can invite library funders, friends, um, board of trustees, patron, we've had patrons, um, we've had them as open to the public meetings, we've had them as, you know, closed meetings. It's it's going to depend if you're at a school library, it's more restrictive, obviously, than if you're in a public library. Um, but and again, if you're in their office, they may have size restrictions. There are some very small offices out there. Um, but it's, you know, it's just where you end up going that that kind of limits that. Um, I think I'll let Brian. Thank you, yeah. Heidi. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm going to kind of echo what uh, Heidi just said. Um, the first thing you want to do is if you're hired as a director or appointed as a branch manager of a library, is to identify who those elected officials are. That's very, very important, especially at the local level. I mean, get to know your, if you're in a town or a village, get to know who your town supervisor is, your, your town board members, especially if they have a library liaison. Uh, invite them to the meetings, to your board, to your board of trustee meetings, uh, whether you have the monthly or, or bi-monthly, whatever. Uh, it's very important to keep, keep in touch with those folks. Um, uh, go, I mean, you go, you go to the and then go to their websites uh, and get their contact information and get them to your email contacts. Uh, it's important too. And then down the road, you'll you know as you get to know their team, uh, their you know, their executive assistant and all the other people that are that work for that legislator or the um, or the assembly member of that. Add them to your contacts. Uh, when you want to send an email out introducing yourself. Um, highlighting some interesting facts about your library, what's going on, like for example, summer programming, uh, bigger programs uh, you might have going on. Maybe you got a, maybe you got a famous author coming. We have to come to that stuff. And I know this sounds obvious, but address them on an email formally. You know, dear Senator Gallivan, or you know, not just you know by their first name. You have to be formal first before you, when you, as you get to know them, then you can start, you know, addressing them by the person. Um, but that's, that's after the fact. Um, and they ask them for a meeting for whichever day, like, like Heidi said, be flexible. Whatever day is convenient for them. I mean, their schedule will definitely contact you um, and arrange a meeting. So, for example, if, you know, if, if they want to schedule a meeting on, on your day off, well, then you know what? You change your day off. Or if they want to meet you at the end of the morning when you're scheduled in the afternoon, well, when you come in the morning, I mean, you have to make it convenient for them because they're very busy, as Heidi had mentioned. Okay, so uh, let's see. I mean, you can invite them to a scheduled story time. They love doing that because, uh, especially during the summer, they like the publicity. Uh, they like uh, interacting with their uh, constituents because you get a, you get a, you get a good attendance for that. And then notify the media, uh, you know, notify your local papers, like uh, I would notify the Hamburg Sun. They would send a photographer out, take some pictures. Because again, they love the publicity. Um, it gets their name out there and stuff. Um, and if you have a media department, like the Buffalo Ernie County Public Library has a development communications office, if you're doing a bigger event and you want additional media, like a news station, to come out and do the story, uh, I would contact Joy, Justice and Guino. And then I work with, I've worked with her several times for the years, and she will work to get media out for coverage. I mean, we did, a, we had a, we put in a, a music garden last October uh, or last year at the Lakeshore branch. And we had a grand opening uh, in October, though it was lousy, but we you know, get a lot of people out there. We got funding through uh, Assembly Member Rivera's office and uh, to get to get musical instruments. And uh, she invited the press, you know, she got people out there. Uh, we were on chat, I think it was channel two. So we, we got some good good publicity on that. Um, and then like if you invite them uh to a, a story time where they read a story, then you always want to make sure that you you make time at the end to sit down and speak with them. Uh, because that's kind of what it's about too. It's a two-part thing, you know, getting them out to your library, seeing what you're doing, but then sitting down and talking about your needs. Um, but you want to definitely prepare ahead of time. That's very important. 
because, I mean, as, again, as Heidi mentioned, they're very busy. And they get a full schedule that day. You're just one of many stops that day uh, on their schedule. So you're going to want to, you know, plan what you want to say ahead of time. Uh, what I do is I provide a packet for them. I purchased, um, I'll show you, I got these Hamburg Public Library folders. Uh, this is a packet I put together uh, for a meeting I have with legislator John Mills on uh, Friday of this week. And what I include is a list of needs, my business card, uh, my annual report to the community, because that's a thumbnail of what we've done last year. You don't want to give anything that's too detailed, too wordy, because you know what? They, they don't have time to read all that stuff. They get a nice flyer that just highlights the program, show, show them that. And, um, you know, just be, uh, again, just be prepared to talk about what your library, what you do at your library. They're going to have questions, especially if it's the first time they're visiting. Uh, give them a tour. Um, and like Heidi mentioned too, I, like I said, I've got, I've got Legislator Mills coming on Friday to the Hamburg Library because we did the renovation 10 years ago. So we got a whole new section to show him. And then I'll talk about the needs of the Lakeshore Library because I believe that's, that's, that, that it resides, that he represents that part of Hamburg. So then we'll talk about, and I've got pictures to show him what we need, what we want to do there. Um, and then afterwards too, what I did was I purchased, uh, I've got mugs, I've got pens. Give, give them a mug and a pen, uh, especially anybody that comes with them. Because what that does is, you know, they bring that, they bring that back to their office and your library is in their face. It's always there, especially with, with again, with folders. You know, it's, it's always it's always there with them because they've got so many other people coming to them for funding needs and requests. You want to definitely keep the library, your library front and center. And then follow up, you know, follow up with an email, stretching your, you know, or a phone call, stretching and highlighting what you talked about and the importance of, of, of what you're looking to get funded or, or what your needs are. Oh, again. Yeah. Okay. Something Brian said just also reminded me. Um, you you do want to try to get you know as many people to attend as possible, um, but again, you have to be aware of what the needs of the legislator are because some of them really want to know who's coming. Um, they want a list of attendees uh, ahead of time, and you know. For whatever reason, it, they they count them. They want to make sure they're in their district. They whatever whatever. So, you know, you do want to confirm with them that it's okay to you know invite as many people as possible, or do they want a specific list of people? Um, and I think always being in con in contact with your connection, whether it's the scheduler or the legislative staffer, um, reminding them about the meeting. Uh, confirming it and sending that list ahead of time, uh, I think is is something that you want to consider too. Thank you. And this is a great segue into the next topic. How can we make the most of our time with the legislators? How we make the most of our meetings with the legislators, especially if you're just meeting them for a short time, like you often are in Albany, how you efficiently express the messaging that you want them to know, especially when it comes to library funding. And Heidi, I'm going to throw this to you again, since you do this work at a regional level, and you've been to Advocacy Day and all the main time. And then I think I'm going to ask Brian Mayer to tap in after Heidi's finished. Okay, so um, I think one of the, the most important things is to look at the bios, um, get to know your legislator what committees they're on, what leadership positions they have, if they are uh, chairs of committees or task groups, um, what, you know, even where they went to school, you might have a meeting at an academic library that is their alma mater. Um, you want to look at, and you can get some of this information from um, from the directories. I don't know if, if I can, can I share my screen here or not? Um, Let's see. Oh, I can. Okay. Um, so one of the things that you want to look at, whoops, I have to move this down, is, um, so this is just the assembly 
website and it's an alphabetical listing of of the assembly members so if i were looking at george alvarez and i wanted to meet with him um i would look at his biography and i'd see you know he was born in the dominican republic da 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 da, da what his degree was um where he where he got his education something about his personal background um and his grassroots approach to inequity. So he's he's an activist. He's really into social issues, um, public service, and it talks about where he represents. Like um, he's a member of community board, and these are his top issues: immigrant families, racial justice, affordable housing, and good jobs. So, um, so you have somebody like that, and then you have somebody like Joe Angelino. Um, so again, you know, you want to read his biography in the about section, and then you can see, um, law enforcement veterans. He was a vet, he's a veteran himself. So all of these different, um, kinds of information can really be helpful to you in terms of connecting library services to issues that they're interested in, um, in organizations that might be within your, um, uh, community that you could draw into some of these meetings, a veteran, uh, somebody from a fire department, somebody from a community, uh, community based organization, depending on who this person is. It also tells you about topics maybe that you want to avoid. Um, you can kind of get a sense from their political um, uh, messaging, uh, what kind of issues they're really interested in. And you can even look at on that site on the uh, assembly member site it'll show you appearances that they've made speeches that they've made um legislation that they've supported and their committee membership so you can get a lot of detailed information from those sites for both the senate and the assembly about the person you're going to meet with so you can kind of um deliver a message that resonates with them personally as well as you know, in, in the larger sense of, of not losing sight of what our overall goal is here, um, but making a personal connection for them to what it is, why it's important to fund libraries, because you should, you know, libraries support the things that they're interested in. Thank you. And Brian, do you have anything to add to that? Absolutely. So um, I, I think Heidi shared a lot of great sort of information, right? Um, you know, having an awareness of, of who it is that you're meeting, um, some of their connections. I think um, also being aware of, you know, the time that you have, as, as it has been alluded to, is somewhat limited. So making sure that you maximize the most out of that time by, you know, having clear, concise messaging, um, and that's where, you know, drawing from the work that Nyla does and puts together, right? Like that repetition of that messaging, that's sort of why we talk about that piece. If they're hearing it as they're stopping in different places, that same messaging, I think that's important. Um, but also to what Heidi said, you know, personalizing that messaging as well to building a connection to them in terms of why it's important to them, why it's important to their constituents, whether it's the more tangible piece of construction aided physical libraries, um, or even if it's some of the more abstracted uh, legislative asks around uh, the importance of media literacy and other pieces like that, but having and personalizing pieces of those connections. Um, and then dependent upon what, you know, the library space and the lens that you're coming from, um, you know, reflecting those priorities connected to all of those pieces, right? You know, so connecting from your lens to the shared messaging coming from Niall and the rest of the groups that are meeting with the legislators um, and having quick, short, digestible pieces that you can sort of then share with them. I'm gonna share my screen for a second. So for example, uh, here you go, share this. So for uh, for example, um, you know, school library systems last year and again this year, you know, have taken and pulled together nihilist messagings and sort of their priority goals to build a quick, short, digestible piece to be able to share with legislators to highlight the importance of library materials aid, to pull in Nyla's language, but also to give some visualization and personalization in terms of why those efforts initiatives are, are important. Um, and so sort of bringing that 
with you um, is important. And also um, the other piece I would say is that sometimes when you come into those meetings, there might be a lot of people in those meetings from a lot of different library spaces and every single voice in that room is important. Um, and those meetings um, should be sort of structured so that every voice has an opportunity to sort of talk and share, e even if like, you know, you might show up and there'd be a lot of numbers of like people supporting their local public library or maybe their academic institution, depending on where that meeting is taking place. But everybody should have that opportunity to have a voice. Don't feel intimidated or afraid to speak up because your voice, your concerns, your lens matters and the fact that you're there even if you're a, a body of one you know you're there reflecting the needs of of your libraries of your people um that you work with and you know that time for you to be able to share with them is powerful so take advantage of that time when you're there one of the things i want to add to what brian said is um uh the idea about that the one page sheet that he showed you um, these are wonderful. Again, they, they want something that's quick, like nothing more than one page bulleted. They'll follow up and ask for more information. Um, but for these meetings, you want to just do a uh, very quick visualization. Those charts that, um, Max showed earlier about the trends in funding, uh, for library aid and construction aid, also very key to these meetings because they are ways to get into the conversation saying, if you look over the years, this is what's been, we've been trending down or we've been trending flat. And, you know, and and then then you bring in and you show them Brian's uh, school materials aid. And, and, and it's like saying this is happening. And because of that, here's you bring in your witnesses. Um, it's like the evangelical moments. Um, so then that's where people who accompany you on these visits can come in and speak on behalf of why this, you know, how this is impacting their library, this decreasing or flat funding, what it's caused in terms of staffing, in terms of materials, in terms of outcome, like student outcome or workforce development outcome or health outcomes. Um, this is how this is impacting people in your community. So, yeah. And one more quick add. Um, there, there are often lots of topics that 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 you want to touch on and, and you have a limited time. You don't want to overwhelm them with too many things because things get lost in the shovel. Um, but there are also occasions where you want to tee things up as well, too. So, for example, we, we, we go back to Novel New York, right? Like Novel New York, when we first started conversations with legislators a couple of years ago, when there was already an understanding that these shifts were going to be happening. And that first year we had conversations with them really was an education piece. It was raising awareness around this. And there wasn't an action at that particular time. But because of the, the weight of what was going to happen, it was, hey, listen, we need you to be aware of this. There is going to be some decisions that are going to be coming next year. But we want to raise your awareness now so that you're informed so that next year we're in a place where we can request, you know, action that we would like to be taken on you, you know, by your behalf. So you don't want to put too much into those meetings, but if there are perhaps some waves that are going to crest later, that it's important to build a foundation of understanding now, I think, you know, sort of navigating through that. And again, that's where sort of Nyla's advocacy page helps build an awareness in regards to what are the pieces that are focused on now, but you can also see some of the other things that are building and going to be coming later. Thank you. I have a question for Brian Holt, and then I want to ask Lucy about how she personally prepares for these meetings. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about storytelling and developing an effective story and how, some tips on how you do that. So Brian Holt, how, since you work with board members and members of your community, especially, and you invite them to your meetings with your legislators, how do you efficiently prepare your board members, your friends groups, to why advocate for the local library, how you get your patrons involved, and how you prepare them? Um, do you end up trying to prepare them to have a unified voice and message, or do you just let them speak? authentically about their experiences using the library? What do you find more effective in that regard? 
Well, what I do is um, we did a um, uh, advocacy meeting here we hosted uh, last year with Heidi, um, with uh, Senator Gallivan, uh, some member of Rivera, and a, and a, and a representative from uh, some member of Burke's office. So uh, I remember that uh, when we met with Senator Gallivan, say two years ago, uh, his question was, is we're, all librarians, we're looking for funding. We're looking for it because we work for the library. His question was, where's the public? <laughs> Where are the members of the public, you know? I want to hear from them. So last year when I worked with Heidi about, you know, hosting um, an advocacy meeting here, I contacted, I've got a partners list, partnership list. I work with several uh, volunteer organizations in the community, in the village, in the town. Uh, the Hamburg Garden Club, we have, we have our friends group. Uh, it was just formed about four years ago. And uh, oh, oh, imagine Hamburg, all these, all these groups that work in the community, I contacted them and I said, "Look, we we need, we need to get we need to uh, get the troops together. We need to advocate for library funding." And uh, for though I mean, I know Caitlin, you were there and that, and Heidi, I filled the room. I mean, they were they were really surprised and shocked how many people were there. And we have the ability to uh, our wall opens up, so I was able to open the wall and extend the audience out. So it was a good showing, and that's what you got to do. You, you got to get the community involved. Uh, especially when, when you're meeting, when you're having these advocacy meetings. Uh, as far as the trustees, yeah, I, I keep a, I keep my trustees in, 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 involved and informed of what we need to do. We talk about these at the uh, at our at our meetings uh, separately too. When I see them, uh, that you know we need, and especially when advocacy, we're, we're going to start preparing for advocacy meetings now. And I encourage them if they can, you know, if their if their if their jobs permit that, whatever, to please show up. Uh, because it's it's integral that they that they especially you know, the, the the board president or that they I mean they need to be there the officers uh, to show that they are you know, they, they, because one of the one of the responsibilities and duties is to advocate for the library so it's really integral that they're there and again uh, the friends I mean they're, they're they're the fundraising arm of of your library if you have a friends group and uh, you know it's important for them to to advocate I've even I've even encouraged them to Go to Albany. So does does that answer does that answer the question? Yeah, I think okay. so. And Anything we else? do love seeing the trustees in Albany too because it gives more of a patron perspective in some level mm -hmm. to some of these legislators and not just hearing from staff. And Lucy, I know you are a director of a academic library. You have a small staff. So it's often up to you to advocate for your library on the campus level, this legislative level, state level. And you attend, I know you were at Brian's meeting last year at Hamburg. You've been to some of our smaller meetings as well. How do you personally prepare? How do you end up um, finding your way to share your experiences at, at these types of meetings, both large and small? Um, so I will say that I'm in a bit of a unique position, um, just given the fact that um, I am a librarian at a private institution. Um, for the most part, we do not receive a lot of funding through these measures. Like, you know, we don't get any construction aid. Really, our biggest uh, get from this is going to be the coordinated collection development aid. Um, I generally like to prepare in a couple different ways. Um, Obviously, as Heidi and Brian both said, getting to know the legislators, getting to know what their priorities are um, so that I can relate what I'm about to say to their concerns. Um, I think a lot of people have heard of the SMART goals. Um, I also personally like to use those as like the it's specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound whenever I'm making an ask of someone, whenever I'm trying to persuade someone of something. So in um, my case, um, I actually was at um, Brian's Hamburg Library meeting in my capacity as a private citizen because um, the Villa Maria, Villa Maria College resides in a different district. I was in my home district where, where I live. Um, and so I was kind of trying to do things from both sides of the coin um, in terms of advocating for Novel New York. So one of the examples that I gave um, was specific in terms of we need to keep this resource 
this is this is the goal that we are ultimately trying to seek was the specificity. Um, measurable was I brought statistics. I was able to say that this is something that I have used in my personal life. I also brought the statistics from the college showing that we had, if we had lost this resource, we would be losing 15% of the research that my students were able to conduct. So simple, bite-sized. Um, we also brought up how we were losing out on federal funds. So we were able to use usage statistics, but also monetary statistics of we can measure the loss of the federal money that we would have otherwise gotten had New York State continued its share of the support for this. Um, achievable, when we put it in the context of the very large number that is the New York State budget, that ask seemed a little bit more reasonable. It seemed achievable because it was kind of that bite-sized piece. Um, relevant, I, we all know libraries are great. We love libraries. We work in them, we use them. It's kind of an inherent good for us, but a lot of legislators, maybe they aren't library users or they think that everything is available for free on the internet. And so again, in the context of the novel New York, being able to relate a loss of federal funding and then also the loss of research and development the loss of resources to the business community, the um, those sorts of things, making the case for what they were caring about. Um, another good example was um, John Spears bringing up different programming at the Central Library, reducing public disturbances that were happening downtown. Um, that was something obviously that a lot of legislators care about. Um, maybe they're not necessarily interested in the specific program, but when you tell them the effect of it, how it is relevant to the things that they are campaigning on, it can be very helpful and opens their eyes a little bit more. Um, and then time bound. The, again, Novel New York was like, well, this is going to end at a very specific point if you don't give us the money to keep it going. And so those are the things that I try to advocate for. Um, when I'm talking about CCDA funding, um, again, I am able to say I was able to buy this many books. Um, it's something that we coordinate across the region. This is good for beyond just my library. This is something that supports all libraries in the region. It's like $4,800, which is approximately nothing in the New York state budget. And this is going to be useful for a lot of other people. It's a wise use of state resources and it happens every year. So please keep giving it to me. And so that's kind of the way that I try to think about these things. Um, I also try to be kind of mindful about um, the, the tone and making this like, like a conversation. So sometimes these meetings can sometimes seem a little bit like um, we're going to them, you know, hat in hand, please give us these things. Um, I like to bring in examples of what they have already done that has been achieved and measured and has been helpful. So kind of bringing in those success stories that we have already had. Um, and again, with those statistics and that kind of gets them in the mindset of, oh, we have done something. It's, I'm trying to think of how I wanna phrase this. Sometimes it's easier to keep doing something than to start something entirely new from scratch. So when you're having these conversations with the legislators, if you can show them what you have been able to do with what you have, then it's a little sometimes easier for them to expand on it rather than we're like building a completely brand new library. You know, help us fix this roof might be a little bit of an easier ask than build us a whole new building kind of thing. Um, so that's just sort of some of the things that I like to do when I go in. Um, and I'd like to also have specific stories. If I can get a student to come with me, um, that's always nice. Um, it hasn't unfortunately happened yet, but I'm still working on it. Um, and so trying to get those personal real examples in um, to illustrate your point, I think is also very helpful. Um, the storytelling aspect, everyone loves a good story. That's why we have children's story times. So I try to become prepared with those as well. I agree. The personal stories are the things that really capture their attention. Uh, we have had students speak at meetings. I, I remember ECC South and Senator Ryan 
who was then assembly member Ryan, um, being told by a student that the library was the one safe place the student felt they could go on campus. Um, it was the one place where they felt comfortable. It was a minority student and did not feel comfortable on campus. Um, I remember another example of a man who had previously been homeless in Batavia speaking at the public library when we were there with Stephen Holly, assembly member Holly, and um, talking about how the library got him from homelessness to employment and place to stay, place to be. Um, so yeah, those if you can find people, uh, we've had many of those stories, and that's uh, not rehearsed. Um, sometimes unexpected, but uh, those are the things they really want to hear. Thank you, Lucy and Heidi. And I think this is a great segue into talking about how to create those stories, um, figuring out an effective story for the legislator and how best to present data to them. Uh, Heidi mentioned one pages and um, you have all talked about personal stories, but are there any other tips that any of you have when it comes to cultivating the story for the legislators or collecting stories for the legislators? Wait, you muted. Did you call me? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes. I, I think everybody shared fantastic tips already, right? You want to personalize it. You want to build a connection to, to, to make your concerns real to their constituents. You also want to think about different ways that you can help get these concepts across. One of my favorite stories was um, when last year we were doing um, at uh, Library uh, Advocacy Day in Albany and one of the pushes and conversation points was around library materials aid. And one of my colleagues to help visualize, you know, how much funding was coming in for library materials aid and what that actually translated was they brought up, cut up pieces of books to reflect how much of a book that the current library materials aid actually bought. And like that visual sort of spark um, and it sparked conversation. It created a story um, in, in a different way, right? Like, cause you, 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 you know, the stories come from, from, the, the people, but also the visuals and pieces like that as well, too. So think of ways that you can reflect and, and, and connect with what's important, your priorities, the messaging that you're trying to do um, through people, but also through visuals and other pieces as well. Thank you. Does anyone else have any tips they'd like to share in terms of cultivating or collecting stories or creating effective messaging for legislators like the cut out book? Huh? Okay. Um, lastly, we want to allow most individuals an opportunity to connect with representatives. I think we've all sort of touched on that a little bit, getting each person to speak their piece. And a follow-up to the meeting, we always encourage people to send a thank you letter to the legislative staff. Uh, we actually have one last year that we put up as a template on our website that people could download and then just change the information uh, to their specific legislator and sign their own name to make it a little bit easier. And we are going to move on to discussing advocacy day. And I want to know how many of the attendees here have been to advocacy day in Albany. So we're going to do a quick little poll again, and just a yes or no. Just out of curiosity, pretty even. Uh, 48, yes, 48% yes, 50% no. Okay, oh, now it's 50% yes. So it's happening half. So Advocacy Day is an interesting time 
where we all came in to Albany and meet really quickly with the state legislators in their own legislative offices. It's it, all in one day, and these meetings are probably about 5, 10, sometimes 20 minutes long, depending on how much time the legislators have. So you really have to maximize your messaging and the limited time because it's not just you, you're meeting with other library systems. You're meeting with library systems from other parts of the state because you might tr share the same representative. Uh, but why should you participate? Why why go here when we're also doing a local meetings? Heidi, I think you're the best one to answer this question. Why do we encourage our members to attend advocacy day and all being in as well? I think I could just volunteer one answer. Um, it goes back to the very beginning. We want to speak with a unified voice across New York. Um, and so it's, you know, at that point, it becomes the numbers game. It's a show of force. Um, most, there are many, many organizations that do advocacy in Albany, and they all have a designated annual day. Um, and sometimes our library day is overlapping with other people's, could be the, you know, uh, ETM's advocacy day or the teacher's advocacy. It, it could be anybody's. Um, so it's, it's a, to show them um, the, the, the force of numbers. Like these, this is important to New Yorkers and look, we're all here in Albany. Um, we can do more unique messaging when we do the local visits and we can cultivate those relationships um, but the Albany visit is a different animal. It's really to promote a statewide sense um, and to get them to get their colleagues to uh, pay attention, whether it's in their committees or on the floor. Um, you can ask to be introduced on the floor um, by your representative. You can ask to have quick meetings with them. It's It's a tough time because it's generally during their session and they're if you look, you can see on that assembly website, um, not only the leadership, but the committee meeting schedules. They have meetings all the time, all day long, uh, literally back to back, Monday through Wednesday. So <clears throat> um, the opportunity to actually meet your legislator that day is slim. Um, you're more than likely, you know, to be quite frank, you're going to get an intern who just started in January, <laughs> who, who, uh, it is very unsure of themselves, um, but you know you you're there. You show up. They know that you're there. You've you've talked to the scheduler. It could be a different person, or it could be the same person that you've talked to for the local meetings. Um, but you schedule that meeting, and now Nyla has a site where you can actually once you've scheduled a meeting, you can add it to their calendar for the meetings, so you don't overlap. Um, you know, like our Western New York region overlaps with Senator Borello for the Southern Tier Library System. And, um, you know, it, we want to avoid double scheduling meetings if we can meet together um, even better. So, uh, yeah, it's a pretty hectic day. A lot of stair climbing. And um, what types of material do we typically bring for advocacy day in Albany? Do you bring a whole bunch of stuff? Do you bring just specific night low messaging? What's the best way to handle it? Heidi or Brian Mayer, you both have attended multiple times. Uh, what do you suggest that people, especially if they haven't been before, what should they bring? Um, uh, I would say, you know, if, if you have been before, you definitely, again, you want to have something short and concise. Your your time is incredibly limited, much, much more so than those locals, as um, Heidi has mentioned. So a lot of times, a lot of times, you'll though, you'll be leaving things, right? Like you might not be able to touch on everything. So if you are bringing something that you're leaving with them, um, you want to make sure that while being short and concise, it does give a good overview so that that document, that one pager in and of itself um, encapsulates everything that they would feel that you feel that they would need to know about the particular topic or issues or pieces that you sort of uh, want to push. You also, and, and one thing I'll say to what Heidi said um, as well too, is while you may not always meet with 
that a particular legislator. Uh, some of the staff that you might meet with really are oftentimes like the pulse that drives sort of their their interest in direction. So you know, be be respectful and mindful of your interactions with them um, because a lot of times they're just as important of a person to meet with as the legislator as well too, because they're parsing through everything. Um, and the last thing sort of in reflection to what Heidi said about the day and the importance of the day is, is the numbers, but it's, it's also like the energy. There is, there's a certain almost like, like concert vibe to it that, that when you're there, the energy that's there and how that sort of um, sort of builds into the messaging and the legislators have to work together and knowing that their counterparts and peers are also having these meetings builds to, again, helping move the needle on some of these things that we're trying to. So Brian, you're saying all we need for the rally in the well next year, glitter cannons. I always have one in my trunk. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> um, but no, I think I think what he said is really important, and um, one of the one of the key things too for this is that um, the timing of it. So when this takes place, a lot of your work's already been done at that point. A lot of decisions have already been made um, about the budget. So it's uh, I don't want to say it's like a almost like a prelude for the coming year, but but you're always working on establishing relationships. And, and I think that you should look for opportunities even outside of the meetings that you've scheduled. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've been on my way to another meeting or coming back from a meeting and I'll run into a staffer I recognize or an assembly or a Senate person I recognize. Um, and, and I'll stop and you know just talk to him for a few minutes. So any opportunity you have even outside of the scheduled meetings to network with these people. Um, I think it's just, it's really important building the relationships constantly. I, I would like to echo that as well. Um, I will say that you don't know today's intern might be tomorrow's assembly member or senator. Um, a good example is at Villa, we have um, an alum, Zanetta Everhart, who was working in the office of Tim Kennedy. And she was able to get his ear on a lot of different initiatives that really helped the college. Now she's running for office herself. And um, it's, it's just having those connections can really make a big difference. Um, even maybe inviting one of those staffers to become part of your board of trustees or something, depending on how, how your library is setting up, set up, getting them involved in some way and getting that individual to have that connection to you that you might then be able to nurture that into something greater later. Yeah, you always be kind to them. You always be grateful to them um, and, and it will pay off definitely. Yes, thank you for mentioning that. We definitely see other staffers go on to office, whether it's Buffalo City Council or higher up, maybe like Lucy said, and an assembly member themselves. Um, I have another question relating to advocacy day. We actually have a couple more questions, but Heidi, this one is probably also for you. How do you prepare for the unexpected when in Albany or actually even locally? When there are no shows, missed meetings, what do how do you handle those types of situations? Sorry, I was having trouble. Can you repeat that? Yeah. Um. When there are no shows, oh. um, people missing meetings. How do you handle those types of situations? So you you mean when the legislator fails to the representative fails to show up for the meeting, yes. like absolutely nobody shows up for the meeting and you're in an empty office? No, no one shows up or they're extremely late. Yeah, empty oh. office, that sort of thing. Again, you know, you, you always try to be deferential to them. I mean, it is annoying and it's kind of rude, <laughs> but sometimes it is out of their control um, because they get called for a vote on the floor or something, then they have to go. Uh, something comes up, they have to be, or they just forgot because they 
have so many things going on. Um, so never, never, ever be rude, never reprimand them. Uh, never, you know, just um, try to, to salvage the situation, speak to someone who's in the office. Um, and if there's nobody in the office, like I said, I go down the hall and I look for not even just Western New York representatives, but if I see somebody who I recognize is the chair of the library committee or the chair of the education committee or, you know, something that I can talk to them about libraries and nobody's in there, I'll walk in um, and I'll, you know, just quick, just say, can I have a quick minute of your time to um, to tell you something that I think is really important that you might want to know. Um, so, you know, just you basically keep moving that day in Albany. You don't stop. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Library Advocacy Day is a fine mention. I put it in the chat. In 2025, they did set the date. It will be Wednesday, February 5th. And still, the director of Western New York Library Resources Council mentioned that we will be implementing a single folder for our local and Albany media. So we'll have everything from the libraries and Nyla in one folder that we will give to the legislator. And we do have a question in the chat relating to this. Do regional library councils, WingLark, RLC, other schedule group transportation for Library Advocacy Day? Uh, we have not done a group bus in the last couple of years. I know Heidi hitched a ride with the Central, Buffalo Central Library people to Albany. Uh, a few years ago, pre COVID, we did try and do a joint bus with WingLark and or all the gather, but we didn't get enough people to fund the bus. Um, trying to think if there are other opportunities for group transportation to make it easier for people to get out there. Does anyone do any carpooling or anything like that at your institution or your system? I'm gonna take the silence and the no. And, but that's something we can always revisit in the future. Uh, I see TCRC is, CLRC is hoping to do a van this year and OWL carpool is definitely great. I think if there's any, if you're at a system level or a regional level, and there's any way that you can provide transportation, it definitely helps people get more people to Albany that would otherwise not be able to go. And next, we're going to talk about staying engaged in advocacy year-round. This is not a one-time thing. We don't do this one part of the year. We try and do this all year-round. And I'm going to actually turn this over to Lucy because we do have a question for you. And this is more on your lo very local level. Can you speak about how you advocate for funding from your own administrators when you're on campus? Um, I think this is part of year-round advocacy work that you're frequently doing. So I'd like you to share a little bit about that. Of course. And also, I think there are, yes, I do have um, an administration that I can request funding from, but I think a lot of the techniques that I use kind of do apply. Um, so I think the biggest thing is finding your champions, your power users, the people that like absolutely adore you, sing your praises and are very thankful whenever you're able to help them with something at the, at the desk. Um, and then this sounds kind of cruel, but using them. Um, so if you are in, in an academic institution, that might be particular faculty members that are power users or um, a particular instructor that you know, loves to always have you come in for informational literacy instruction. For a public library, that might be um, a local business member, someone who has used your resources to launch their own business or um, some sort of connection that you have with a community group, maybe like your local youth bureau. Um, finding those connections in the community and people that are already on your side and then involving them in your campaign. So um, I can say, you know, I can be in a meeting and I can be requesting something saying, hey, I need this. And then having those other voices 
there along with you show that it's going beyond the library, that it's not just you and your tunnel vision for your own department, but making those connections showing that other people do care as well. Um, obviously, politicians love votes. So whenever you're advocating for anything, um, showing that there is a large base to draw from of support as an even advocacy day is all about numbers, getting those people on your side. Um, so for me, that's a big part of it. Um, also, again, highlighting that a lot of times we need to have matching funds to maintain what we are getting from other sources. Uh, so for example, um, CCDA, I have told my administration flat out that if they cut my budget, they're cutting more than just that budget piece. They're also cutting our state funding because we wouldn't qualify for it anymore. And that has been a large wake up call that it's not just about the what they do locally, but it does have ripple effects elsewhere outside. Um, and then kind of going back to what I said about finding your champions is supporting their events and what else they're doing. So it's a two way street. You can't just always ask for that one faculty member to go to bat for you in a meeting when you need something. You need to do the same for them. And I think this also applies for legislators as well. So if you are going to their events that may or may not be library related, but you are showing support for them in their goals, in their contexts, then you they get to know you as well. and that becoming that familiar face and not always coming to them, asking for things, showing that you're giving something back to them as well can go a really long way when it does come time for you to actually need to ask for something. So um, I kind of hope that that answered the question in full. Um, I can go into more detail, but I know that we do want to leave some time for other questions to answer. Well, that was great. Thank you, Lucy. And finally, Holt, I also want to ask you a similar question. Since you're doing so much advocacy, not just with the state legislature, but on your extremely local level. And there's actually a question in the chat that I also would like you to answer. How do you answer it? Um, but what can someone on a library board of trustees do to help with funding for libraries without having a conflict of interest or overstepping in any way? And Heidi said that trustees should not perceive their advocacy as a conflict of interest unless it would be construed as a personal or business benefit to them. And Brian, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I mean, basically, you know, you, know, you don't... Uh... It is, is, was touched upon earlier. You don't think about political, you know, whatever the political persuasion is, whether it's a Democrat or Republican. You have to work with everybody, regardless of what your political persuasion is. So, you know, the key is, is you're looking for funding for projects, initiatives. What are going to give you the money? That's who you work with. You got to work with those folks, you know, regardless of their political persuasion. And, um, the other thing too is uh, again what Lucy echoed uh, earlier, um, again in, uh, supporting or partnering on local events and initiatives. I mean we've been involved with uh, food pantry donations with elected officials where we would you know get the staff I would get my staff to donate non perishables and we would drop them off. Uh, getting involved in any outreach events they're doing. Uh, example, Assembly Member Rivera does a movie. Uh, movie day at the Palace Theater on a Saturday. We set up a table. We're there. Uh, again, it's not just ask, always asking, asking for, for money. You have to get involved in, in their things. And, and the other thing, too, is well, another example, he just uh, back in August last month, uh, he did a uh, crayon, crayon collection uh, where he took uh, used and broken crayons, collected those, and uh, so we could, they could, he took them to somewhere where they make new crayons and they give them to needy children. So we, along with the Grand Island Library, uh, they ship their, you know, they, they ship their crayons over to us because this district office is a block, a block from the Hamburg Library. And we just, we went over and collected the crayons and we dropped them off and said, these are from the Hamburg Lakeshore and Grand Island Libraries. And lastly, if um, offer your meeting room or meeting space for an event that they're doing, uh, we've done emergency preparedness uh, training. Uh, 
with some of them where, where we, you know, they, they want to, they, they want to start, you know, they're, they're hosting using the library space. So that's, that's always another good thing too. It, it just stays involved. You're supporting their initiatives while at the same time you're getting them to try to support yours. Thank you. And Heidi or Brian Mayo, do you have any, any tips on maintaining your relationship with local legislators year round? I guess I'll go first. Um, yeah, it, it is similar to everybody, what everybody else has said. You know, it, it is um, outreach opportunities for, for um, maintaining conversations with them, being involved in, in sort of their interests, following up with them after um, meetings um, and offering of supports and thanks recognizing when, when they have um, made statements or um, been a part of votes or putting things forward and, and making small outreaches to thank them for that. So those efforts aren't unnoticed um, and, and unrecognized. Um, and also, um, and slightly to, to skew a little bit to what some of the others have said is continuing like that, at, you know, the extension of advocacy work is always like to, to help everyone understand, right? Like we, you have those meetings with legislators, you go to advocacy day, those are spark points, but that work happens all year long. You're, you're, you're building momentum to get to that point. You're recognizing people that you're going to partner and work with to help move those pieces forward, to amplify those voices in terms of like being creative, in terms of recognizing as um, I think Lucy said that ripple effect thing and then seeing, well, where would those ripples hits and who can be our partners to sort of help continue and come together for some of these advocacy conversations. You know, Novel New York happened because there were a lot of people that came together across not just library types, but a lot of different spaces. You know, um, Nyla was a part of these conversations, academics, public schools were a part of these conversations. But both these DSs came in and they were a part of these conversations that helped NYSED become aware who became part of these conversations. And finding these partners to work with all year long, to raise awareness all year long, to help move things forward all year long. You know, I think about like construction aid, right? And we think about the impact locally on, on, on library buildings, but who does that work, right? Like your local trades, your local craftsmen, your construction people and bringing them in because more construction aid means more jobs. It's refocusing and rethinking and building those shared conversations together so that when you are having conversations with those legislators to outreach to say, what are the, you know, sort of the progress that you're making during the year, but also helping those partner groups and those other individuals and building connections with them so they can echo your voices. And I just want to add, <laughs> excuse me, I just put um, the link to the Assembly and Senate sites on there. In the Senate, you can follow legislation. So, and that'll tell you who's a sponsor, who's co-sponsoring, if somebody signed up, if it's your representative. Um, so you can kind of follow legislation. It'll send you alerts when things change as a bill or something, an issue moves through. Um, the other thing is you can sign up for their newsletters. Most of these people have newsletters uh, or get alerts from their websites um, so that if things are happening in the district and they're doing something um, and you can somehow tie it back to libraries, uh, or, you know, bring up libraries as a potential resource for whatever it is they're doing, um, then, you know, you'll get these um, kind of reminders or alerts or feeds that uh, uh, would help um, help you tie into things that are happening during the year so that they don't just see you during budget time. And you also, and you brought up a great piece about following legislation, but you also, there's like a little way for you to provide feedback too, because there's this little piece where you can say, do you support this legislation, yay or nay? And it's a little bit of an informal polling, but those little tiny pieces, those little bits of feedback help, you know, help legislators sort of keep their finger on the pulse of thought. So that's, that was a great uh, thing you brought up, Heidi. 
Thank you so much, everyone. We are we only have about four minutes left. I did put a link in the chat to our upcoming session called Represent Your Library at Every Kissy Training for Legislative Meetings. It will be October 17th at 10 a.m. Shell Nam and Joy Testa Sanquino will do a deep dive on uh, more specifics of the legislative meeting and what to talk about and etiquette and all of those types of things. And then Jen put a link in the chat um, to the certificate of attendance and also to complete our post webinar survey. We might have time for one more question. This is about students and children at Albany Advocacy Day. If you are able to solicit student volunteers, I will corral them on the trip and ways of prepping, prepping them for what to say to legislators. I have not worked with children um, at Advocacy Day. I actually don't know that I've really seen many children there, but Heidi or Brian, if you have, do you have any tips on that in the short time we have left? I, I don't really have any tips in, in that capacity. Usually, like, so a lot of times from the, from the school lens, specifically for Advocacy Day, because it's during the school week, during school hours, oftentimes it's harder for uh, school librarians to get out to attend. Um, and that's just sort of unfortunately sort of the nature where we're at with release time. So a lot of times a school library systems directors are are there sort of as the voice for that. But um, yeah, I don't have any tips. I haven't, I've only gone a couple of times and so I haven't been a part of students or younger people going. Yeah, somebody put in the chat, um, there have been students. There have been busloads of students been brought in for Advocacy Day in Albany. Um, t-shirts and everything uh but it's easy it's easier for them to you know we'd have to charter a jet or something to get people from western new york there <laughs> but um yeah i was gonna say i've tried to get students to go um usually the barriers are you know working around class times and transportation um but i have been a little bit more successful um getting students to advocate on campus and um, i will just say i'm not above bribery candy and food works really really well <laughs> to get students you know excited about the library and willing to share their um, thoughts and opinions and, and things and advocate for the library because it gives them things <laughs> We have talked about the idea of doing some videos that we could send to the legislators for uh, library patrons um, who can't make it to Advocacy Day. Uh, so that, you know, that's another option. I, I will say, um, and again, because we're watching New York, Albany is super far, you know, far away. So the Albany local people is great. But um, uh you can take advantage of your local. So not for Advocacy Day, but if you are setting up local meetings. So um, Western New York Library Resources Council last year, we had um, one of the legislators come into one of our local high schools. So if you're doing your local ones when they're in town, that is a fantastic way to connect student voices um, to give, you know, even, you know, a lot of times they want to know ahead of time, you know, what is the schedule, what are going to be the talking points, but you can build in time for students uh, to ask questions, to be engaged especially like at the high school level, if they have a participation in government class or something like that. Um, it's exciting to see those connections happen. Thank you so much. We're just about out of time here. I wanna remind everyone again to uh, check the chat for the certificate of attendance and the webinar survey links. Uh, locally, we are working on setting up legislative meetings and libraries in the area. Uh, keep an eye on our website for that information. It will be forthcoming. They will all be taking place after the election and make sure you vote too. And I wanna thank everyone for being here and uh, thank you for taking the time and spending your morning with us. Have a great day.